Our scripture reading this evening is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And the chapter in its entirety is the text of this evening's sermon. First Corinthians 8, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when, ye so, when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Thus far we read God's holy word. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, these two words themselves, Christian liberty, are bound to cause a reaction. They're bound to excite some feeling, some sentiment that you have in connection with those words, Christian liberty. Christian liberty indicates a truth of Holy Scripture that is often pushed around, sometimes battered, sometimes used and abused, sometimes unlawfully taken hold of. And so often, it is misunderstood. That is why so often it is ill-used. We can picture Christian liberty as a large area, large area of the Christian's life and his walk. The area of Christian liberty is carefully marked off and carefully bounded by God's law walking according to God's law, within the boundaries of God's law, there's a tremendous amount of freedom that is given to us Christians in our walk before God, in our way with our neighbor, with our fellow saints in the church of Jesus Christ. And that area is clear. 
that area is free. And in it, we are free, according to uh, 1 Corinthians 8, to eat, and we are free not to eat. Neither the better, neither the worse for eating or for not eating. All Christian liberty. But so very often, Christian liberty is abused. On the one hand, a legalist will attempt to take the boundary of Christian liberty and close it in. Adding laws, adding commandments, impinging on Christian freedom. Others, having a more antinomian bent, are busy pushing at the boundaries of God's law, pushing it further and further away, making more room where there ought not to be room, using Christian liberty in service and pitting it over against obedience to God's law. So Christian liberty can come to have a rather poor name. Yet we must see how often the Apostle Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, treats this subject and explores this subject throughout so much of 1 Corinthians, not only in chapter 8 and chapter 11, but very practically also in chapter 7, whether or not a Christian is to be married or to remain unmarried. There's also a vital gift given to the church of Jesus Christ for its betterment, for its prosperity, for its peace, and for its unity. For it is especially in the exercise of Christian liberty that we are able to love one another and to seek each other's good at our sacrifice or in our sacrifice of Christian liberty, controlling, being disciplined, even in our liberty, for the sake of weaker brothers and sisters in the church of Jesus Christ, and in that way to love them. Such is the charity that edifies the church of Jesus Christ. So then we consider this text, 1 Corinthians 8, under the theme, Christian Liberty. You consider, first of all, the loving knowledge, secondly, the proposed case, and finally, the right conduct. You must consider very carefully and very thoroughly what this knowledge is of which the Apostle speaks in the very beginning of this chapter. Now, as touching the things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up but charity edifieth. That knowledge will be considered very practically also in verse 4, touching the same matter, matter again as concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know. We know. What is this knowledge? This knowledge, which the Holy Spirit warns us that it puffs up, is not an evil knowledge. It is not an untrue knowledge. It is not a lie that masquerades as knowledge and as truth, that sweeps us in with its deceptive force away into some kind of error, which ends up hurting or harming the church of Jesus Christ rather than, than helping. It is a knowledge that is really the knowledge of salvation. It is the knowledge of the one true God. It is the knowledge of God's revelation given to us in his holy word, in which you and I must receive constant instruction. It must be for us as the object of our constant study. Our calling is to receive this knowledge from God's word, to receive this knowledge through the preaching of the gospel, and through study, meditation upon this knowledge, constantly to grow in it as the true knowledge of God's Word. That is the knowledge of which 1 Corinthians 8 speaks about. It is for us to hold and to have, to embrace and enjoy in our hearts, our minds, and our souls, as this knowledge leads us to the one true God, as knowledge keeps us in the right worship of his glory and praise and honor and keeps us in the right service of him. 
This is knowledge which must fill our minds. This is knowledge which, to a large degree, must control and determine our life's way in the midst of this world. And we are called to receive this knowledge as a good gift of God given to us. For this knowledge is the knowledge of the gospel. Now we can be sure that this is exactly the kind of knowledge that the Apostle Paul is talking about from the verses that follow in from verse 4 and on. As I said before, he brings up the same matter as with, with which he introduced this chapter, as touching things offered unto idols. Verse 4 is concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered unto idols, we know. What is this knowledge? This is the knowledge that formed the basis of the Apostle Paul's preaching and teaching, especially to the Gentiles, on his missionary journeys. He took note of all the idolatry of heathendom. Wherever he went, he said to the people, what you worship, what you serve, what you call your gods are vanities. They are nothing. They have no power, they have no glory, they have no works. All the works that you attribute to these idols are the works of the one true God. All the glory and praise and honor and sacrifices that you give in devotion to your idol, idol gods, all that glory, all that praise, all that honor belongs to the one true God. He alone has made all things. He alone, in, alone is to be rightly praised and worshipped and trusted. Such we have in verse 4. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, that there is none other God but one. There is the ground. There is the basis. There is the truth at its heart. But we must continue on in this knowledge. Though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on, in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Here is the doctrine of creation. Here is the doctrine of salvation. These works, the vastness of creation, the precious wonder of redemption, all attributed back to this one true God, which God has accomplished through his Son, Jesus Christ. All things of God, all things by Jesus Christ. We, the church of Jesus Christ, also of God, according to his eternal decree of election, also by Jesus Christ, purchased to be his by his blood, gathered by his call through his word and spirit to be knit to him, to be joined to him forever and ever. There is our salvation. And out of that knowledge is to be derived every following point of doctrine. Every following point of truth, everything that you can believe, everything that you can know, everything that you can find from God's Word must always go back to these fundamental points and must lead you and me in knowing them to give praise, glory, and honor and to serve this one God through and by His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the knowledge that no man has by nature. As we are all by nature idolaters. This is all the knowledge that we have by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, by the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. And how is it then that Scripture itself can say of this knowledge that it puffeth up. It 
it will puff up, it must puff up, it must become a matter of pride if we hold it all by itself. If we simply hold all of it as simply a set of propositions that can live and be maintained simply by themselves somewhere up in the air apart from us without having their full impact upon us to humble us to our knees and recognizing the great glory of this God and of his son Jesus Christ who has created all of these things and who is in the fullest way our Savior and our Redeemer. We will be puffed up. We must be puffed up. This way of being puffed up in this knowledge is brought to us in a very practical way. Here is the impact of this knowledge, and here is the way this knowledge determines how we act and how we live. We follow to verse 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9 come into the matter of our Christian liberty that we have by virtue of this knowledge. Verse 8, But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat are we the worse. Eating or not eating. For that eating, for that not eating, being neither better nor worse for that eating or not eating. How? Well, eating those things now, specifically that are offered to idols, because we have this knowledge. What is an idol? An idol is nothing. For God alone made the heavens and earth and all things in them. All we are, all we have is by faith in Jesus Christ. Idols are nothing. So, we have this meat offered to, up to, to an idol before us. Shall we eat or not eat? It matters not. We know. That knowledge determines our decisions. And we understand by virtue of what we know, we are free, we have Christian liberty to eat or not to eat. Here is where we can be puffed up. When it becomes to us always, only, an arbitrary decision. What do we feel like? What do we want? Pushing every other consideration out of the way because, after all, this is our liberty. Shall we eat or shall we not eat? Say, yes, I will, or no, I won't, only for that reason and for no other consideration. But we have forgotten really and truly another point of knowledge. There's something else that we are missing. We're missing in that equation that word we. We and us. Verse 6, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. We share to gather this knowledge. Together it is pre proclaimed to us. Together we believe it. Together we confess it. Together we raise up our children in this knowledge. There is this one true, only God who is our God, of whom, by whom we are, through Jesus Christ. And therefore, together, we have this freedom. So something has happened. We have formerly considered Christian liberty, according to this knowledge, as this wide open area, which is bounded by God's holy law. And inside of that boundary, we are free to eat or not to eat. But in that knowledge, here we are all by ourselves. And our only consideration in this decision that we make under Christian liberty to eat or not to eat is going to be, what do I feel like? 
what do I choose to do? And if I eat or I, I do not eat, it makes no difference at all. But I must know something else. In this broad, open, wide area of Christian liberty, I am not alone. I have next to me my fellow saints. I have next to me my wife, my children. I have next to me brothers and sisters, some of whom will be weaker than I. Some of them will have a conscience that is different than mine. And I'm called to have respect to them and to save them in Christian liberty. Not running to God's law here or God's law over there, but in the middle of my Christian liberty, I'm called to exercise my Christian liberty with respect to them. And then the question is not only this, shall I eat or shall I not eat? What do I feel like? What am I going to do for better neither for better nor for worse, to eat or not to eat, but how will my eating affect him? How will my drinking affect her? Because I know, I know, I must take care of them. must have regard to them. I must see to their well-being. I am responsible for them. In the relationships that God has given to me, I must use my liberty for them. May I use my liberty? May I make any decision I'm, I'm pleased to make? Yes, I may, but only if I consult first for the interests of my fellow saints. If I say they are not going to be affected, they're not going to be wounded or hurt or impaired by what I do exercising my Christian liberty, then I can exercise my Christian liberty, but if it should hurt them, if it should wound them or harm them, I may not use my Christian liberty. I must give it up. So we come to this matter that is brought to us, the chief concern of this passage, according to the very beginning. What of those things offered unto idols? You see, the knowledge that we have touches directly on this matter. What about these idols? Well, here is something, meat, offered to an idol. What is it? Is it just a piece of meat? Or is there more to it than that? And here we must deal with the conscience. And the brother who has a weak conscience. Now verse, verse 9 introduces one who is weak or them that are weak. Verse 10, we have any man who has his conscience operating as it does, but in verse 11, he is introduced as a weak brother. He is a brother who is weaker, but his weakness is characterized by one simple fact. He is not emotionally weak. He may not even be spiritually weak. His conscience is weak. His conscience is weak in this very particular way. The weakness of his conscience is that to him an idol is still something. Now here we must understand a distinction between this weaker brother's knowledge and his conscience. There's a very great difference here. 
This weaker brother is a brother in the church of Jesus Christ. He's heard the same word. He believes the same word. He confesses the same word. And he's able to say everything that is spoken of in verses 4 through 6. He knows it's true. It's part of what it means to be a Christian. There is only one God. There's no other God but he. And yet, though converted, though holding this truth in his mind and his heart and his soul, his conscience is still troubled by the weight, the evil weight of idolatry attached to that meat. It has been offered up to an idol and the gross horrendous, abominable idolatry, sin of idolatry, attaches its taint and its filth to that meat. It has been offered to an idol. So the foremost thought in this man's mind, as soon as he looks at that meat and considers that meat, is not that there is one God, that there is one Jesus Christ, of whom and by whom are all things, and of whom and by whom this man is, but that it is meat offered to an idol. He's troubled. He's bothered. His conscience bothers him. And we are meant to follow this man through a pathway. This man is going to see you sit in the temple of that idol. That man is going to see you eating that meat without a qualm, without a bother, without a worry. He's going to see you eat it with a free and clear conscience. But his conscience being weak is going to embolden him. He's going to take a step, a bold step. And now he is going to join you in the eating of that meat. But in that bold step, he then falters. He's emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. As soon as he has eaten, the devil will attack him. The devil will say to him, do you know what you just did? You ate meat offered to an idol. You participated in that filthy, abominable practice of idolatry when you ate of that meat. How can you be a Christian? How can you be a believer? And the devil will work to cause this man such despair that he will say, I must not be a Christian. I must not be a believer. I must be, after all, an idolater so assailed by the devil. Scripture holds out this end of him, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Terrible end. How is this to be taken care of? How is the situation to be remedied? Let's go backward in our travels. To, the, to our starting point, and to say, here is required a kind of behavior. There's a certain word, a certain rule to be followed, that is, not to eat. But what is interesting here, if you look very carefully through 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you will find no such commandment. Later on, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul will give a commandment. Do not eat. But here he does not. For the concern of Scripture is here to avoid taking this matter of Christian liberty and putting it into the realm of God's law. So you do not have instruction given to you, either for you to go back and to say, well, going back all the way to the, to the very beginning, it is your calling to take only one route, only one track here. Do not eat. Or 
Where does the Apostle Paul explicitly say, after the end of all of this teaching, all this discussion, saying, I have therefore a rule for you, because of these considerations, you may not eat, and so issue, so he might then issue a commandment. What commandment does he give? Simply this, in verse 9, but take heed. Take heed. And that is Christian liberty. Take heed. Not to look through your Bible and say, there must be some kind of law. There must be some kind of teaching here, some kind of doctrine that I'm going to be able to go by so I might know what, I'm not, what I cannot do here in this, in this situation, whatever it is. It's our calling to say, I must take heed. I'm called to think carefully. I'm called to consider, to weigh and to ponder and know through my pondering, through my consideration, what my action might mean to my weak brother in consideration of him and his needs to let those things regulate my behavior. Here a most amazing and the most interesting thing happens. According to the knowledge that we talked about first, this knowledge that puffeth up, we can say, well, there is their Christian liberty. An idol is nothing. The one true God has made the heaven and earth and everything in them by and through Jesus Christ. And therefore, this is Christian liberty. If I eat, I'm no better. If I don't eat, I'm not any worse. Christian liberty. But that's not only Christian liberty. Christian liberty is also not to eat. Christian liberty is to say, because I take heed to my brother, who has a weak conscience, whose conscience can be defiled by my actions, who is going to feel guilt because I'm interested in him, because I have regard to him. Christian liberty means that I am not and that really I may not eat. So at the same time, I might say, exercising my Christian liberty, yes, I am free to do this, I must say, in another sense, in Christian liberty, I am not free to do it. I may not do it for the sake of my brother. So Christian liberty is not only to be affirmed. It's not only to be upheld. There are times and places when Christian liberty must, must, must be denied for the sake of the welfare of another. In this way, Christian liberty does not become imposed. Christian liberty does not become a standard law of behavior and conduct in every kind of situation. A legalist cannot take this and make it a law. It must remain under Christian freedom. The way of Christian liberty I can defend. Can defend, we can defend our right to eat. But at the same time, we must say there are times when you may not eat. There are times when you must not eat. Regulated and controlled, not by some kind of law, but by care and regard for the brother. In this way, we come to the right conduct in Christian liberty. We have a line of questions that We are meant to take us to a certain place. We have seen this way before, verses 10 through 12. Verses 10 through 12 begins with our eating. 
continues on with a weaker brother eating. And it leads all the way to his perishing. And it said of him, shall this weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Then verse 12, when ye so sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Christ is the end. As the one who shed his blood for his church. Not just for me, but for my brother over there. How can I seek to destroy him for whom Christ gave his blood? And if I sin against him in causing him to stumble, I do, I do not just sin against him, I sin against Christ. Think of the word of Jesus Christ to the Apostle Paul. As Paul was going to Damascus to persecute the church of Jesus Christ in that city. The words with which Christ confronted the Apostle Paul. I'm sure some of you children have gone over them in catechism. And a few weeks, a few weeks ago, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why persecutest thou me? As Paul stood holding the coats of them that stoned Stephen, as Paul dragged Christians out of the synagogues to have them arraigned before the Jewish council, and as Saul in his hatred of Christians went to Damascus, he was not just persecuting Christians. He was not just persecuting the church, he was persecuting Christ. How we regard our brothers and sisters in the church. How we treat our brothers and sisters in the church is how we treat Christ. And what we do to Christ. How different things become when we consider that truth. And how that must shape and mold our conduct. And Paul gives his answer in an astounding statement at the end of this chapter. After leading us all this way, even to Christ himself, the Apostle Paul gives his judgment and his answer as an example. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. There the matter is very clearly laid out. To the cause, I make my brother offend. It's not just an aside. It's not just an unintended effect or consequence. In my responsibility for my brother, I have made him to stumble. And it becomes such a matter as this, according to the language of the apostle, the only conclusion if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh. I will not ask whether it is offered or not to an idol. I will not find, try to find out where that meat came from. I will eat no meat. I'll become a vegetarian. And how long? Not until that weaker brother is out of view or left behind in that city over there, or when I'm in private, then I will eat meat, but I'll eat no flesh while the world standeth. So great is this matter to become. And yet he will not say, you may not and you must not do. He will still say, take heed. Therefore we must conclude that we must speak about the exercise of Christian liberty as moral right conduct. There is a law about Christian liberty. It is rather different from God's moral law, but it is for all of that a moral law. It does involve right and wrong. The right is this, take care of your brother. Take care of your sister. Take care of them by your conduct, by your behavior, what you do and what you do not do. For in this way, 
you are taking care of the cause of Jesus Christ. You are taking care of Christ. You are taking care of his body. In this blessed way, then we can understand then what is meant in verse 1. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Charity edifieth. In 1 Corinthians 8, charity edifieth. That is an amazing word. Charity edifieth. The proper exercise of Christian liberty edifies the church. Now, we're used to thinking of Christian liberty not in that way at all. We're used to thinking of Christian liberty as simply a neutral exercise that at the most causes no harm, does no damage. So I might say, on the one hand, this exercise of Christian liberty, if I'm free to eat or free not to eat, I can say, in this or that instance, exercising my Christian liberty, I look around, I consider, I see that no one is going to be hurt by what I do, so I will go ahead and do it then. What damage does it cause? We go beyond. We say in this exercise of Christian liberty, I see a weaker brother or sister, and considering that weaker or brother or sister, I know that they're going to be offended, they're going to, hurt, to be hurt if I do this matter that belongs to Christian liberty, and therefore I will not do it. Sure enough, is the only thing that I can say that I have done is that I haven't hurt, I haven't caused damage, I haven't offended them. But that's far different than edifying. Edifying is a powerful word. It speaks of building up. It speaks of increasing. Edification is addressed directly to the power and the glory of the church in its union and in its fellowship. This word edification shows to us the place that Christian liberty has in 1 Corinthians, the whole book, which is devoted to the unity of the church of Jesus Christ as belonging to Christ, his body. So then how does exactly our exercise of Christian liberty edify the church in the most powerful way? This is the way. Christian liberty is not about what you can do. Christian liberty is about what you give up. What you give up. What you do not do. What you do not eat because of your regard for the weak brother or the weak sister. There is something powerful about that. For Christ's sake, when you deny yourself what you are otherwise permitted to do only for the sake of the brother or sister, you don't bear a grudge against them. You don't see them as impinging, hindering your Christian liberty. You see it as an opportunity to show your love for Christ, to show your love for that weak brother or that weak sister. And in the exercise of that love as charity, as sacrificial giving up of yourself, you love them more. You love them more. And perhaps even somehow, some way, not because you tell them, somehow, some way, they understand that you love them. You are concerned for them. 
you care about them, even to the extent of sacrificing yourself for them. They are endeared to you. And such is the happiness, the blessedness of the church of Jesus Christ to exercise yourselves in a denial of your Christian liberty for the sake of one another. And that is the marvelous and the glorious way that you and I are able to mirror, to reflect the love of God that is so wondrously, sweetly, and powerfully appealing to us. We love him because he first loved us. We love him because he shows to us, he demonstrates to us his great love. Oh, God was free. God is free to send or not send his only begotten son by whom we are. He was free. He was not free to create all things. He freely showed us mercy. He freely gave himself, sacrificed himself in his only begotten son to redeem us. In that marvelous way, that marvelous way in which God determined to redeem us, to purchase us back to himself by the very blood of his son, that very powerful, efficacious instrument of the cross is also at the same time the most wondrous expression of the love of God to excite and to kindle in our hearts a love back to him who has done so much for us. And it becomes our blessed privilege then to sacrifice ourselves freely in taking heed to one another and to give up what we might rightly hold on to for the sake of one another. In this way, it is our privilege to use our charity for the edification of one another, the church of Jesus Christ, and to show, to aim at the glory of our God and of our Christ in his body among ourselves. So let us eat, so let us drink, so let us do all things to the glory of our God. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank thee for thy word. We thank thee for the precious and wonderful gift of Christian liberty. We thank thee for the opportunity in our fellowship with one another to exercise ourselves in this delightful gift to help to serve and to love one another. And we pray that through this exercise, will thou be pleased to build up, increase, and prosper us as a church of Jesus Christ our Lord. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen.